Kimmy here with section 6.3. This is the big one from this chapter, uh, which we'll talk about enzymes and factors that affect enzymes. First thing we want to look at is what we call metabolic pathways. Okay, that is a pathway uh, in memory. We talk about metabolism. Is that all those chemical reactions that are taking place in your body? Well, oftentimes one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. We call that a metabolic pathway. So there's all these intermediates. So we have the beginning, the initial reactant or substrate. And in our cells, it's turned into substrate B and then C and then D, E, F. These are B, C, D, F are all intermediates to get to the final product, which is G. Uh, this is just kind of a partial thing. I, I'll show you this in class. Uh, this is one of my favorite posters. Um, it's the Metabolic Pathways uh, from Roche Scientific. And it's kind of the company has changed hands a couple times. But in 1960, a scientist started putting together all the known pathways in human cells. And they just kind of kept adding to it and adding to it. And what they came up with is basically a metabolic map that you can fold out and and see all the different pathways that are in your body uh, so down here this is kind of zoomed in and it's pretty cool they show you the structural formulas they give you the names and then this becomes this becomes this uh, notice that it's not always a one-way kind of a one-way thing uh, sometimes things can go this way or that way or it can go that way, so it can come down here, and it can go that way or that way. So depending on what enzymes are present, and you see they put all the known enzymes in blue. Uh, and this is a pretty cool map. Um, I'll also link, uh, also link to the site where you can go, and there's an interactive map of this where you can zoom in and move around, and it's really cool. Now, for all these pathways to occur, I showed you in blue there are enzymes. Enzymes are proteins, okay, they are the biomolecule proteins, uh, and they function as catalysts. And you learn in chemistry, catalysts are things that speed up a reaction without being used up in that reaction. So, and they can keep causing that reaction over and over and over again. Uh, the reactants in an enzymatically catalyzed reaction are what we call substrates, and they produce a certain product. Uh, each enzyme is specific. So if you look back at that map, um, all those blue enzymes, there's specific enzymes for each one of those little <clears throat> chemical reactions that's taking place. And each reaction in the pathway requires a unique and specific enzyme. So a more modified version of the A through G is on each line we put like E1, E2, that's enzyme 1, enzyme 2, enzyme 3, enzyme 4, enzyme 5. And often, you know, that's a good question on a test. Uh, let's say you're given a poison or something that takes out enzyme 3. What happens in the cell? Well, A will turn to B, B will turn to C, but C cannot be turned to D. So oftentimes what will happen is you'll get a buildup of an intermediate um, molecule C in this pathway because it's dead end, it stops. Uh, and so sometimes you'll see that on test questions. How do enzymes work? Um, they, again, form fits function, F cubed. Uh, enzymes are proteins, so that final shape of the protein determines what reaction it helps take place. And more specifically, that area or the site, active site on the enzyme, is what binds to the substrate. Okay, and it causes a shape change. Uh, we used to call it the lock and key model, like there's a certain enzyme that fits a certain shape, okay, and it would, you know, cause a reaction. Uh, now we know that it's more of an induced fit model. There's a slight alteration, and I'll show you that here on the next slide. Okay, induced fit, that slight alteration. So here's a substrate. Okay, so we have a rounded edge, and I, obviously this is simplified. Um, and you'll see down here, this isn't perfectly rounded here and not perfectly pointed. But what happens is it they do kind of sort of fit. And once this substrate hits the active site, okay, it causes sort of a, what we would call the ES complex or enzyme substrate complex. It kind of like think of it as sort of as sort of 
as it meets, it kind of gives it a hug. It kind of grabs it, causes a reaction to take place, okay? And then it releases, and then here go your two products. Okay, again, down here is more of a three-dimensional or space-filling model of an enzyme where you have an active site right here. And notice what happens uh, when the reactant fits in there, you get kind of this, this pinching, okay, this little pinching where it will sort of give it a hug or it'll sort of close up that shape, bring it into close contact, and sometimes it will, in this case, like up here, uh, it's cleaving that bond and so it breaks it into two products. And that last slide kind of brings up a good point. Okay, that was an example of a degradation, okay, degrading, breaking it down. You have a single substrate, okay, that is broken apart into two products, okay? So breaking down. A lot of times a common one you'll hear is a hydrolysis reaction. A hydrolysis reaction is where you add in a water, Okay, you add in a water to cleave or to cut or break apart a bonds and break two molecules apart. The opposite of that is a synthesis. And we've learned this before as dehydration synthesis, okay? Where you take two substrate molecules. We talked about this with how we put our two biomolecules together. Okay, you take two substrate molecules, you take out a water, you take an OH off of one molecule, Ah, an OH off of one molecule and an H off another molecule. Okay, and then you use these bonds here to connect the two together. So you're taking two things and joining them together and released as a single product. Again, this slide is just a visual of that. So the first one here, degradation. Our substrate, we're starting here with one solid thing. It goes in the active site. Here's our ES complex. Enzyme leaves can go back and cause another reaction, and you, end, you have one substrate, and you end up with two products, okay? So degradation breaking down. Down here, you've got two substrates. They go both fit in the active site, okay? Dehydration synthesis, we probably put those two together. Enzyme is free to cause another reaction, and you have a product with one piece. They're joined together. A lot of times molecules do not react with one another. They must be activated. And uh, we'll take a look at that old endothermic, exothermic, or endergonic, exergonic uh, graph. Uh, and you'll notice, if you remember, there was that hump in the graph. Okay, that little hump, that little kick in the pants is called the energy of activation, or E subscript A. Uh, and this prevents molecules sometimes from just breaking down spontaneously or breaking down too fast in the cell. Uh, in other words, we re it requires an energy for it to break down. Okay, enzymes work by lowering that energy of activation, uh, and oftentimes it's bringing things into close contact with each other or influencing the way the molecule's reacting or interacting with other things. Okay, so in this graph, uh, you see that here are our reactants up here, pretty high. Down here's our products, pretty low. So we have a what? Our delta G is negative. Okay, so this would be an exothermic or exogonic reaction. Okay, but notice you have the blue line in this kind of orange or tan line. Normally, it would need a a kind of a kick in the pants all the way up here. Okay, so your ener energy of activation would be this much energy right here. If you add an enzyme, okay, now notice it lowers that quite a bit, almost in half. And so it causes this reaction can take place much faster with the enzyme. Factors that affect enzymatic rate, uh, obviously one is substrate concentration, or we could include it with that enzyme concentration. So our keyword here, concentration. As you have more substrate, enzyme activity is going to increase because again, uh, these molecules, they're random collisions and when the, they fit into the active site, you'll get a reaction. Uh, if you have more enzymes, obviously you're gonna get more reactions. And oftentimes our graphs look something like this, whereas you increase the substrate or enzyme concentration, as you increase the concentration down here, uh, and you have the amount, amount of product here, 
uh, it will go up, 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 up until you get kind of, it will actually level out at sort of a max rate, okay? So if you ever see that graph, look for the maximum rate. Uh, think of it as smashing the accelerator on your car and you go faster, 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 and you, till you get to your maximum speed until your car does physically, the motor can just not go any faster. Okay, so you're maxed out, okay? Temperature looks a little bit different. Again, when we talk temperature, that's temperature is the average kinetic energy of, of molecules. So if it's warmer, the molecules are moving faster. And so you're generally going to get an increase, okay, as the temp down here uh, gets higher, you'll get more enzyme reaction to about a certain part, and then you'll notice it die off, okay? And oftentimes with a lot of enzymes, that's usually around... 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. Why? Well, that's body temperature, and that's usually optimal temperature. If it gets hotter than that, that can cause the enzyme to denature. It disrupts the secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure of that protein, and it begins to blah, sort of melt or change shape. Okay, And when it changes shape, the active site no longer fits with the substrate. Okay, And you know it, it will no longer work correctly. Okay, so it can destroy enzymes. Um, the third one, pH, we'll look at on the next slide here. Uh, most enzymes are optimized for a particular pH. Uh, and we'll look at the example of pepsin and trypsin here in a second. Uh, the first uh, slide here showed is just showing the effect of temperature. Okay, again, so you get this general increase here to about 35 or 40 degrees, and then you'll see that it begins to denature when you get hotter than that. Uh, and this makes a big difference with ectothermic or cold-blooded animals versus endothermic or warm-blooded animals. Okay, ectothermic need to have warmer environments, and you often will see the lizards and the snakes after a cold night uh, in the desert or wherever, kind of laying out in the sun, trying to warm up their body to get their enzymes working faster to get their metabolic rate up. Whereas uh, Warm-blooded animals can survive in like the Arctic and so forth because uh, they keep their body temperatures more at that warmer 37 degrees Celsius, okay? and it doesn't vary as much, and their enzymes are already working, and they can have a higher metabolic, metabolic rate. Uh, this slide is showing the graph with the effect of pH. Uh, and again, I told you I'd mentioned pepsin and trypsin. Uh, pepsin is the uh, enzyme that breaks down proteins in the stomach, produced by the gastric glands in the stomach, whereas trypsin uh, is produced by the pancreas and dumped into the small intestine. Okay, look at their optimal pHs. In other words, for enzymes, they each have their optimal pH. Pepsin, which works in the stomach, well, what else is in your stomach? Hydrochloric acid, right? Where does it work best? Here to pay about a pH of two. Okay, remember this is very acidic, whereas seven is neutral, and then this would be basic over here. So pepsin works good at very acidic temp or acidic pHs, whereas trypsin in the small intestine is your food squirts the food out into your small intestine. Uh, there's also sodium bicarbonate coming from the pancreas that brings the pH back up. And so trypsin works best in the small intestine to break down proteins at a pH of about eight. Okay, now notice outside of this range too much for either of these enzymes, okay, you will see it begin to denature and that protein won't, enzyme won't work very well. Uh, cells can also regulate enzymes by the presence or absence of things we call uh, coenzymes and cofactors, okay? So again, and here they mention the concentration of enzyme. So if your body needs more of something, it builds more enzyme and then you'll get more product, okay? That's pretty, um, pretty straightforward. But the cells can also activate or deactivate some enzymes. Okay, these are called cofactors and coenzymes. Cofactors are molecules required to activate an enzyme. A, a bunch that we'll study this year, uh, FAD, NAD, and NAD+, okay, in cell, these two are in cellular respiration, they're little electron carriers. Uh, and this one is in photosynthesis. 
uh, they are cofactors and they're used uh, to with different enzymes to call it to carry electrons and hydrogen ions coenzymes okay this is why you need vitamins in your diet they're small organic compounds uh, required for you to eat in your food uh, for the synthesis of coenzymes that help turn on certain enzymes to make them functional to activate them uh, two uh, sort of enzymes that you'll see that help do this okay, would be the kinases and the phosphatases. When we get to the cell communication chapter, uh, you'll learn about how kinases uh, will take a phosphate group from ATP. Okay, they're taking the phosphate group from ATP and they're going to add it to the protein, okay, which may activate it. Okay? Okay, where it may some pathway or enzymes would then be turned on. Okay, if you have enough of something, you may receive a signal uh, that causes a phosphat phosphatase uh, to remove that phosphate group. Okay, P subscript I or inorganic phosphate, and it will inactivate the protein or turn it back off. Okay, so some just to bring this up because you may see this again or you will see this again this year on your exam is the idea of kinases which add phosphate groups and phosphatases which remove phosphate groups. Uh, this slide is just showing uh, here's your enzyme Sorry, that's in blue you can't see it very well uh, here this big blue space filling model like we saw earlier okay here's an enzyme here's the active site okay what you see in red here is actually the cofactor that kind of slips into that active site and helps the substrate bond. And again, you see the induced fit here uh, as it sort of gives it a pinch or a hug and causes that reaction to take place. Uh, there are some things instead of helping an enzyme work, uh, there's things that can inhibit, okay, or prevent an enzyme from working or decreasing its activity. Uh, there's competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. Competitive because the, the inhibitor and the substrate are both trying to bond to the active site. Okay, So if you have an inhibitor and it gets to the active site first, then the substrate can't get in there. You can't have a reaction. So they're both competing for that active site. And the product can only form if it happens to slip in there, get into that active site before the inhibitor does. Non-competitive is where the inhibitor binds to uh, somewhere else called an allosteric site, somewhere else on the protein, but then that causes a change in shape in the active site uh, so that it no longer fits or works properly. Uh, sometimes cells use this just to shut down pathways. So here you see a metabolic pathway okay, where you have substance A, Okay, the first initial pro or first reactant here uh, fits into enzyme one, gets changed to B, C, D, E, F is your final product. F can actually come back and bond somewhere else on the enzyme, what we call an allosteric site. And look what happens here. That changes the shape of the active site so it no longer fits with A. So once you get enough end product, that end product can actually come back and shut down and shut down the initial pathway or shut down the enzyme. Uh, there are some uh, that are irreversible. Okay, they are irreversible. In the last example, if you use up some of that product, uh, then that pathway could turn back on again. Uh, things that inhibit an enzyme and and are irreversible and can be deadly, we call poisons. Uh, some ex examples of that are cyanide gas. Uh, they use this in gas chambers. Uh, it shuts down the pathway, the enzyme required to make ATP. Without ATP, your body can't function. You need an ATP we talked about last video uh, is the energy currency of your cells. And so that uh, cyanide can cause death. Uh, number two, uh, sarin, or sometimes we call it nerve gas uh, because it messes up the NMJs. Uh, the neuromuscular junctions uh, that we talked about in bio 2 where the motor neuron comes in and attaches to the muscle it can cause it to uh, contract or stop contracting uh, nerve gas messes that up uh, there have been i remember in tokyo growing up there was a nerve gas attack and it made the news uh, kind of used as bio warfare uh, the third one warfarin 
Warfarin inhibits an enzyme for blood clotting. Uh, we actually use this in rat poison. Uh, we use that on our farm. And it, it's kind of nasty. It just it causes internal bleeding. Uh, if there's an injury or something happens and the bleeding starts inside, uh, the rats and mice will just bleed to death essentially from the inside out. Uh, it's just you have to be very careful when you lay rat or mouse poison uh, that we are very careful that our dogs and those or children and those stuff don't eat it because it can be deadly. Uh, in small, do small do doses, uh, it's used in a blood thinner called Coumadin. Uh, people with heart problems, uh, you might hear them being on a blood thinner. It actually has warfarin in it, but just in a small dose, a small enough dose that it's not deadly. Small enough dose that it's helpful and thins the blood and keeps it from clotting, uh, but not so large that it can cause death.